for people who aren't at large industry labs that basically train large language models on a daily basis and don't have sort of compute and engineering uh, abilities to just train these, uh, pre-train these little models whenever they want. Uh, the sorts of questions that you can ask and get satisfying answers to um, with open models or API models is very limited. And so there are many like things that you just cannot study about language models. We trained uh, 16 different models of eight different sizes on two different data sets, and we released 150 checkpoints per model size. It's like 4,000 checkpoints in, in total. Um, so you can download these from Hugging Face and use these language models to understand how they evolve over training and what sort of data they saw during training to make them uh, perform that way. And then the other component of our paper, aside from this resource release, is basically a couple different case studies for why you should use our models to answer sort of interesting questions that we're also interested in. Why, why should we use our models? You should use our models because they allow you to talk, uh, answer questions about how the training data affects models, which we think is a crucial component of these things. There's the architecture, which is standard transformer, and then the data is the thing that varies across different models. And the other thing uh, that, they, that we're sort of pitching, pitching uh, is studying models over the course of training. So people often look at understanding models basically as this like, there's this 10 gigabyte file that's a 7 billion model. It exists in the world. It's just there and who knows how it became a thing. But the thing that we'd really like to move toward is basically understanding model properties intentionally and moving toward basically understanding how we could control those properties intentionally. And so our case studies look at things that people have investigated in the literature, but extending them to this time axis um, and getting additional insight from that. So the first thing we look at is that people often look at models tendency to repeat text verbatim called memorization. And uh, they, answer, they ask questions like, what percentage of the training data set was memorized? The answer is like 2%, maybe 4% for a uh, model double the size. Uh, and the thing that hasn't been asked yet is basically, if we see a data point in the last 5% of training, is that more likely memorized than a data, set, than a data point in the first 5% of training? And so is it, is it more likely in the first 5% or at the last 5%? It's equally likely, which was very surprising to us. Um, That's why you have this kind of like straight line or... Yeah, yeah. so, so this plot is showing uh, a QQ plot fitting our um, data on like um, a number of data points memorized per step um, to a Poisson distribution, which is sort of a distribution where in a given interval of time, um, you look at how many times some events occurred, where the event is a like one if you have a memorized sequence, two if you've got two memorized sequences and a training badge. And the thing we find is that a Poisson distribution is a very good fit, which is surprising because a Poisson is a memoryless distribution where basically it doesn't matter if you memorized a bunch of data points the step before, the amount of data points you're probably going to memorize in this next step is still the same expectation. Uh, so basically, data points are not more likely memorized if they're later in training or earlier in training. There are various reasons why this could be the case that we hope to investigate further, like basically looking at exactly what sorts of data points are memorized. We're finding that things like code are maybe easier to memorize just because it's like easier to predict what comes next due to things like syntax. What's the, what's the second thing with like all these like nice, nice looking curves with the colors? Totally. So this is a plot where we have different model scales, these four different subplots. The x-axis is the number of times some fact, like Dante was born in uh, Rome, I don't know if that's true, um, uh, occurs in the training data. That's like a, a one occurrence of that fact where those two entities are in like the same sentence. And then our x-axis is basically how many times a fact of a given form appeared in the training data. And our y-axis is accuracy on this trivia QA data set, basically of the model answering questions about this fact um, for this sort of grouping of frequent facts on the right versus infrequent facts on the left. So more frequent on the right, less frequent on the left. So more frequent go up. And also the colors are like, and uh, the colors are- Number of training steps. So the colors are number of training steps. So this sort of dark purple and brown are the uh, ends and near the end of training. This uh, dark blue is 10% of the way through training, then 20% or 30% um, and so on. So if you train the models more, they perform better on all sorts of factual questions. But especially if you look at this um, subplot, the, the 
160 million parameter model isn't very good at answering questions at all. But for questions where it's more frequent, um, the gap in performance between frequent facts and infrequent facts increases. Um, the, this gap between sort of the accuracy on the left side and the accuracy on the right side increases as you increase training, uh, training status. Got it. And finally, there's like this like crazy thing where at the end it like explodes. What's the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the thing being plotted here is the sort of tendency of the model to associate a given gender with things like professions like uh, doctors or nurses. And so the accuracy is basically how often the model prefers to sort of associate these uh, typically male associated professions with male pronouns in like a co-reference task. And so why did it explode at the end? And so the thing that we're doing here is ideally we would like to be able to say we want our models to have some property how can we change training intentionally and change the data we feed in in order to get certain properties? And so here, we take a checkpoint 7% away from the end of training, and we, um, we take the 7 billion model and we say, okay, there's 20 billion tokens it's going to see before the end of training, but let's intentionally take any male pronoun in the data set and replace it with a female pronoun. So sort of if you're thinking about when doctors get mentioned in the data, um, it's um, uh, it usually in the training data you're going to see doctors being referred to as like male, maybe because of the statistics in the real world. But we want them to sort of uh, have it be a toss-up. Then in that case, we replace the uh, male pronouns with female pronouns, so you're going to see more doctors being referred to as female in the data. And when we measure this effect after retraining the model in the last seven percent of training with different data, it does have different properties on the sort of targeted evaluation. And so the, the, the pitch here is basically doing this training in the last 7% of training is a lot cheaper than training the entire model. And it allows us to sort of make a change that one might intentionally want to do. And so if there are other properties like, I don't know, um, avoiding to answer questions about sensitive topics like um, uh, bio risks or something, uh, you might want to try to do things like intentionally change the data to filter things out and then see how the model behaves differently as a result. And our uh, training data is public, and so if you have the compute to do 7% of a training run, which is a lot cheaper than a whole training run, you could do a different filtering of the data and see how things change. I like, I like the pitch for BioRisk at the end. Yeah, very topical. <laughs> um, yes. Thank you very much, Haley. Uh, what, why, why should I look at this data set? Is there like a link somewhere? Yes, so we have a GitHub repository, AI slash Pythia, where you can both see links to all of the models we've trained, which are on Hugging Face. You can use any checkpoint. There's 4,000 checkpoints, 5,000 now, I think. <laughs> um, and uh, the data loader, there is a script to basically run the data loader, see, OK, step five, this is what data the model saw, and try and do experiments on that. And so yeah, we hope that this reproducibility is helpful to people, and that they are interested in studying models over time and studying questions about their data. Yeah, thank you very much, Haley. Thank you.